Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host, Eric. Hello. Today, we will be exploring the sinking of MV Wilhelm Gustloff due to the evacuation during Project Hannibal in World War II. Before we dive in, we must inform you, this story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the sinking of a vessel, a botched military evacuation, murder, Nazism, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note, before we begin, that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we have done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, some terminology will be in German language in which neither of us are fluent, but we will do our best to give accurate pronunciations. Before we get started, we will go over the basics of nautical terminology. The bow is the very front part of the ship, and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left, and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hole is the metal sides of the ship. The keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of the ship. Thank you, Derek. Our story begins in the Blom and Voss shipping yard in Hamburg, Germany. For context, in the 1930s, Adolf Hitler was Chancellor of the German Parliament before becoming President of Germany on August 19, 1934. This was the beginning of the rise of Nazism and National Socialist ideas in Germany before the start of World War II. In 1934, we also saw the merger between Cunard and White Star Line into Cunard White Star due to financial difficulties in both companies, as cruising's popularity, particularly with ocean liners and transatlantic transportation, started to wane. Hitler was a beloved leader who valued not only a strong industrial side of Germany, but also heavily valued leisure activities like cruising. He encouraged travel and leisure activities, helping to bolster the cruise industry that was in the beginning of its decline. On August 1st, 1936, at the Blom and Voss shipping yard in yard number 511, the keel for a large, beautiful ship was laid. Originally to be named Adolf Hitler, she was renamed to Wilhelm Gustloff, the leader of the Nazi party Swiss branch after his assassination by a Jewish medical student in 1936. Hitler decided on the name change after having been seated next to Wilhelm Gustloff's widow at the funeral. The cruise ship was 684 feet in length, had a 77-foot beam, a draft of 21 feet, and was 183 feet high from the waterline to the top of the bridge. It was 25,484 gross registered tons and had a five total decks propelled by four nine-cylinder diesel engines powering two four-blade screws. She could reach speeds of up to 16 knots and had a maximum capacity of 1,465 passengers in 489 separate cabins. After her launch on May 5, 1937, MV Wilhelm Gustloff moved on to her sea trials in the North Sea from March 15th to March 16th, 1938 completing these successfully and being passed over to her new owners, the German Labor Front. She was used by a subsidiary organization known as Strength Through Joy to provide recreational and cultural activities for German workers, including concerts, cruises, holiday trips, and as a business tool in order to present a favorable light on the Third Reich. Unofficially, MV Wilhelm Gustloff's maiden voyage was between March 24th and 27th, in 1938, carrying Austrian voters in an attempt to sway them into voting for the annexation of Austria by Germany. On March 29th, she carried workers and their families from the Blom and Voss shipyard on a luxurious three-day cruise. Sounds like the Nazis were using this ship as a front to the public, much like with their public service organizations. And you are spot on with that assumption. On her third voyage on April 1st, 1938, MV Wilhelm Gustloff left Hamburg in order to join the ships Der Deutsch, Oceana, and Sierra Cordoba on a group cruise in the North Sea. Unfortunately, a storm developed on the 3rd of April with 62 mile per hour wind speeds that separated the four ships. 
Meanwhile, in the storm, a coal freighter called Pegaway was caught up in the storm and began to slowly sink as she slowly took on water. At 4 a.m. on April 4th, the captain of Pegaway issued an SOS, and the closest ship to her rescue was Wilhelm Gustloff, who immediately started heading in the direction of the doomed cargo ship in order to assist. After Wilhelm Gustloff reached Pegaway, the 19 crew members of the doomed cargo ship one by one leapt into the water and were rescued on Wilhelm Gustloff's lifeboat number 6, arriving on deck of Wilhelm Gustloff at 7.45 a.m. Pegaway was unable to be towed, rolling to port and sinking. Wilhelm Gustloff and the crew of the cruise ship were praised for their heroic efforts after they returned. Quite an impressive rescue effort. Her fourth voyage was yet another political power move by the Nazi party. She departed Hamburg on April 8, 1938, and anchored three nautical miles offshore from Tilbury, England. Why would she anchor so close to shore and not dock in Tilbury, Derek? Great question, Eleanor. This is because if she remained in international waters, the ship could be used as a portable polling station for German and Austrian citizens that were living in England at the time. They are voting on the unification of Germany and Austria, and on April 10th, 1938, 1,172 Germans and 806 Austrian voters were ferried between the docks and MV Wilhelm Gustloff, where 1,968 votes were cast in favor of the Union and only 10 votes were cast against the Union of the two nations. Once voting was finished, Wilhelm Gustloff left for Hamburg once more, returning home on April 12th. She made another uneventful voyage from April 14th to 19th, 1938, before going on Osterfahrt, or Easter voyage, before her official maiden voyage from April 21st to May 6th of 1938. She once again joined the other members of her fleet, Der Deutsch, Oceana, and Sierra Cordoba, on yet another group cruise, this time to the Madeira Islands near Portugal. On the second day of her cruise, her then 58-year-old c- uh, captain, Carl Lube, passed away on the bridge due to a sudden heart attack. He was replaced by Friedrich Peterson for the remainder of the cruise, Peterson leaving the ship after the cruise and only returning on her fateful final voyage. A little over one year after this pleasure cruise, Wilhelm Gustloff was briefly diverted from pleasure cruising between May 20th and June 2nd, 1939 in order to transport the Condor Legion back to Germany from Spain following Germany's victory over nationalist forces in the Spanish Civil War. Between March 14th of 1938 and August 26th of 1939, MV Wilhelm Gustloff dutifully took over 80,000 passengers on a total of 60 voyages all over the European coastlines. Sadly, with the beginning of World War II after Germany's hostile invasion of Poland in September of 1939, MV Wilhelm Gustloff would find herself in military service. Between September of 1939 and November of 1940, MV Wilhelm Gustloff would be requisitioned by the Kriegsmarine to serve as a hospital ship named Loretzschiff D. After November 20th, 1940, she was repainted from the typical white and green color scheme of a hospital ship to a slate gray, and all medical equipment was removed. She was armed with three 105mm anti-aircraft guns and eight 20mm anti-aircraft guns, and used as a barracks ship for roughly 1,000 U-boat trainees of the 2nd Submarine Training Division in the port of Gdynia then known as Gotenhafen due to the German occupation of Poland. Wilhelm Gustloff would be docked there as barracks for the next four years, except for one notable film production. As a resident movie expert here at Sweet Force Media, could you tell us more about this Nazi film that was made and why it's important to Wilhelm Gustloff, Derek? Why, yes I can, Eleanor. In 1942, SS Cap Arcona was used as a stand-in of some sort for the RMS Titanic in the Nazi film recreation of the tragic sinking. The Nazis cited White Starline and the British's greed and oversight as the main reasoning for the sinking and deaths of 1,496 people on board Titanic. Just to clarify, This is entirely inaccurate and insulting to the victims of the Titanic disaster, and the film was used as a political ploy to turn the German people against Great Britain even more. 
Being that it was filmed in Gotenhafen, the extras in the film were of the 2nd Submarine Training Division who stayed in barracks on board the anchored Wilhelm Gustloff. Wow, sounds like the Nazis were doing what they did best, harming others, manipulating the German public, and destroying the lives of many. After this film's making and the four years docked, Wilhelm Gustloff would have another opportunity for transporting passengers, although this would be during an even more risky military operation, Operation Hannibal, in 1945. And no, this is not Hannibal like Dr. Lecter. This is the German military operation in order to evacuate German civilians, military personnel, and technicians from Courland, East Prussia, and Danzig, West Prussia, which is in present-day Poland. Many had worked on the Baltic in weapon spaces from Gotenhafen to Kiel. In 1945, it was clear to the Germans that they were losing the war and were feeling the pressure from the Allies, particularly the Soviets, to get out of Poland, where the Nazis were an unwanted presence. Tickets for MV Wilhelm Gustloff and other ships participating in Operation Hannibal in order to escape were very expensive, and civilians were panicked to get the hell out of Dodge. The ship's complement and passenger list cited 6,050 people on board, though it is widely known there was a grand total of 10,582 passengers and crew on board after many passengers boarded off the record. A German archivist and one of the few survivors after the disaster of Wilhelm Gustloff noted there were 173 naval armed forces, auxiliaries, 918 officers, NCOs, and men of the 2nd Submarine Training Division, 373 female naval auxiliary helpers, 162 wounded soldiers, and 8,956 terrified civilians on board. Some of the military members were part of the Gestapo, members of Organization Tot, and high-ranking Nazi officials escaping with their families. Due to overcrowding, everyone on board stood practically shoulder to shoulder, even flooding walkways, stairwells, and the decks. The ship was only regulated to carry 1,465 passengers and 417 crew or military personnel total. She was almost five times over the maximum capacity. This would prove dangerous and reckless, sentencing many of those people to death. We have reached the evening of the sinking. Just a reminder to our listeners that we will be dis- detailing the sinking of a vessel, a botched military evacuation, murder, Nazism, and death that some viewers may find disturbing. Going forward, viewer discretion is advised. At 12.30 p.m. on January 30th, 1945, Wilhelm Gustloff left Gotenhafen, accompanied by the passenger liner Hansa that was also filled well above capacity with civilians and military personnel and two torpedo boat exports. Hansa and one of the torpedo boats developed technical issues, could no longer continue, and turned back, leaving Wilhelm Gustloff with her one torpedo boat escort low. The ship had four conflicting captains on board, none of them wanting to take orders from the others. These captains were Wilhelm Gustloff's captain, two merchant marine captains, and the captain of the U-boat complement. These four captains knew they were going to be sailing under the cover of darkness and argued over the best way to avoid attacks from submarines. They could go with all of the lights on the ship turned out to make the ship uh, hard to see in the darkness, or they could turn all of the red and green lights along the side of the ship turned on in order to avoid collisions with other ships. Both options had pros and cons, but in case of submarine attacks, Lieutenant Commander Wilhelm Zahn, a submariner, advised all the lights to be turned out. The route through the water was supposedly being checked and cleared for mines at the time, and Peterson was worried about crashing into the German minesweeper. Captain Friedrich Peterson of the Wilhelm Gustloff eventually decided she would proceed lit up like a Christmas tree in order to avoid a collision in the darkness. It is important to note that although she was being used as a transport ship for injured soldiers and innocent civilians, and should therefore be marked with hospital ship colors and demarcation, she was not, and was also fitted with her anti-aircraft guns, therefore making it legal to sink the vessel within the laws of naval warfare. This sounds like a bad situation brewing. Yes, it definitely turns out this way. Wilhelm Gustloff was soon sighted by a Soviet submarine called S-13, and with her anti-aircraft guns frozen and the submarine sensor on the escorting torpedo boat also frozen, 
Wilhelm Guslav was a sitting duck in S-13 sights. Captain Alexander Moransko of S-13 followed the two ships to their starboard side for two hours in the Baltic Sea before daring to surface his submarine and steering it toward Wilhelm Guslav's stern. He aimed toward the port side, which faced the shoreline, and would therefore be less expected. This move was the beginning of the end for Wilhelm Guslav. At 9 p.m., under the cover of the January darkness, Captain Alexander Marinesco ordered four torpedoes to be launched toward the port side of MV Wilhelm Guslav, around 30 nautical miles offshore near Liba. Allegedly, these four torpedoes were nicknamed as follows. The first, for the motherland. The second, for Leningrad. These two in reference to the German invasion of Russia and Leningrad. The third, for the Soviet people. And the fourth, which curiously got jammed and had to be dismantled, was named for Stalin. The three successfully launched torpedoes all struck Wilhelm Gustav on her port side. The first, for the motherland, struck the ship's bow and caused the watertight doors to seal off the areas where off-duty crew members slept. The second, for Leningrad, struck amidships in the accommodations for the female naval auxiliary helpers, which was located in the ship's swimming pool that had been drained. This caused pool tiles to be shot off at high velocity as though being fired from a gun, causing huge casualties before flooding began to cause more problems. Out of the 373 women quartered in this part of the ship, three survived. The third torpedo, for the Soviet people, was a direct hit on the engine room also located amidships, disabling all power and communications immediately. This made it impossible for the victims of the now rapidly sinking vessel to see or for the crew to signal for help. Soon, the hallways began to fill rapidly with water, and the panicked passengers and crew began trampling each other in a desperate stampede to get to the boat deck, causing some of the initial fatalities. Some of the high-ranking Nazis could read between the lines and knew the chances of reaching safety was low as they listened to people dying by torpedo explosions or gurgling as their screams were silenced by water. To avoid drowning or freezing to death, these members executed their families using their handguns before turning the weapons upon themselves. It has been reported that only nine lifeboats were able to make it off the ship. The rest had been frozen in their davits, or the crane-like devices used to lower lifeboats, and had to be broken free if they were even used at all. About 20 minutes into the sinking, the ship rolled so dramatically to the port side that launching lifeboats became dangerous as the boats crashed into the starboard side and rolled, spilling their occupants into the freezing sea or being destroyed. Scared passengers desperate to escape left from the decks into the Baltic Sea, which was estimated to be around 39 degrees Fahrenheit in the water with wind chills of 0 degrees to 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and ice flows were reportedly covering parts of the surface of the water. For comparison, the water temperature in the Atlantic when Titanic sank was 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and victims in that wreckage froze to death in roughly 15 to 20 minutes of exposure. The majority of those who ended up in the sea succumbed to hypothermia very quickly. Less than 40 minutes after the first torpedo hit Wilhelm Guslav, she rolled completely to the port side and sank bow first 10 minutes later, sinking in roughly 144 feet of water. That is devastating. It can't be stated enough that although there were Nazi officials on board, the majority were innocent civilians. It is estimated today that around 9,600 people died out of the more than 10,600 on board, though the original estimate was reported to be 9,343 lost. Nearby German forces were able to rescue an estimated 1,252 people on the following vessels. Torpedo boat T-36 rescued 564. Torpedo boat Low that had been accompanying Wilhelm Guslav rescued 472. One of the minesweepers that they had been trying to avoid, M387, rescued 98. Another minesweeper, M375, rescued 43. And yet another minesweeper, M341, saved 37. The steamer, Göttingen, rescued 28. The torpedo recover boat, TF19, saved 7. And finally, the freighter Goatland saved two. One baby was rescued by a nearby patrol boat, V1703. Thirteen survivors that were rescued later died to complications from hypothermia. Curiously, even with the precedent of the captain goes down with his ship, 
all four captains on board Wilhelm Gustloff survived, though only Lieutenant Commander Zahn, who had recommended traveling by darkness, had an official naval inquiry launched against him. His assumed guilt was never resolved due to the collapse of Nazi Germany later that year in September of 1945. There were many vessels that were sunk by both Axis and Allied powers during World War II, and this includes military vessels, transport ships, and passenger vessels. However, based upon the most recent estimation of victims, this sinking is by far the largest loss of life on a single vessel ever recorded in history. It is important to note that the sinking is not considered a war crime, despite how horrifically sad it is and how many innocents died. Due to the vessel act transporting active military personnel, being armed with weapons, and not having any demarcation to mark the vessel as a hospital ship, it was a legal and horrifying result of warfare. If you are curious as to what rules I seem to be referring to, I am referencing the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 regarding laws surrounding hospital ships. This states that passenger ships and hospital ships cannot carry active military personnel and transport them. Hospital ships must be clearly marked as hospital ships, and that it is illegal to attack either classification. Other notable examples of passenger ships and hospital ships being illegally sunk were RMS Lusitania in 1915 and HMHS Britannic in 1916 during World War I. Derek, what was the aftermath of the sinking? Well, Soviet propaganda after the sinking falsely described all of women aboard the ship as SS personnel from the German concentration camps, despite there being copious amounts of evidence proving this as false. Only 373 women on board were even associated with the German military, and of those women, three survived. The submarine that sank Wilhelm Gustloff, S-13, later sank another German ship named General von Steuben on February 10, 1945, killing 4,500 people. Due to having faced a court-martial for alcohol problems and going to a brothel with his crew off-duty before sinking Wilhelm Gustloff, Captain Marinsko of S-13 was deemed unworthy of being a hero and was instead awarded the lesser Order of the Red Banner instead of the honorable Hero of the Soviet Union. He was dishonorably discharged in October of 1945. In 1960, he was reinstated as Captain Third Class and granted his full pension. Later in 1963, receiving the traditional ceremony given to captains returning from a mission. He died three weeks after from cancer at age 50, and in 1990, he was posthumously named a hero of the Soviet Union by Mikhail Gorbachev, shortly before the fall of the Soviet Union. Did he deserve to be recognized as a hero for killing 9,600 people, including innocents? I think most people, including us, would say no. Definitely not a hero in my mind. The wreckage of Wilhelm Gustloff is classified as a war grave and noted as obstacle number 73 on Polish navigation charts and lies 144 feet beneath the waves around 19 nautical miles offshore. Aside from MV Estonia, it is one of the largest shipwrecks resting at the bottom of the Baltic Sea and has attracted treasure hunters worldwide searching for the Amber Room, a room on board that was covered in mirrors and lavishly decorated in amber. In order to protect the gravesite, the Polish Maritime Office in Yedinia has forbidden diving within a 1,600-foot radius of the wreckage. In 2006, a bell recovered from the wreck was used as a decoration in a Polish seafood restaurant, afterward being lent to the privately funded Forced Paths exhibition in Berlin. This disaster is often nicknamed, as many shipwrecks are, as the German Titanic. This is insulting to the victims of both Wilhelm Gustloff and Titanic. Both disasters deserve attention and recognition in their own right, along with any other shipwreck that is nicknamed as a Titanic of some sort. This only minimizes the devastation of the shipwreck being compared to Titanic and is a habit I implore every shipwreck enthusiast to break. This episode hopes to keep the memories of the innocents lost on Wilhelm Gustloff alive and to honor the deaths of many. War is ugly, and many times it is the innocent that suffer the consequences of it. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. 
If you like this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the infamous Empress of Ireland, an ocean liner that sank in the St. Lawrence River in Canada in 1914. Don't forget to check out our sister podcast, Slasher Saturday. Have a great week, and we will see you next time.